President. Um, I'm Susan Traverse, the Provost and Senior Vice President, and um, this is the third lecture in our inaugural scholarship lecture series, a special series of um, um, featured lectures by distinguished faculty um, to celebrate this first year of Provost Recorder's Presidency. Um, uh, this evening we're here from Carl, uh, but just as a sort of early advertisement, on February 22nd, I hope you'll come back to that uh, Tuesday evening here in the same location to hear Carmen Sarancino, uh, who is a professor in our English department and creative writer, uh, speak to us on life, point blank, war as a metaphor for ordinary life. Uh, and then on March 27th, again, in this location, uh, Dr. Jane Cavender, who uh, she's with us tonight, professor of biology, will be speaking on the T antigen uh, oncoprotein, inducing cell and student transformation. Um, so uh, please look forward to those lectures. Um, it is my pleasure also tonight to introduce uh, President Strickwarda. Um, over the last six months, I think we've done this a number of times, and I think at this point, at least on campus, <coughs> Carl doesn't need an introduction. Um, however, tonight he speaks to us not as, as, sorry, as the president of the institution, but as a member of the faculty and as a distinguished scholar in the field. Um, President Strickwater is a uh, specialist in modern European history and the history of internationalization. He's the author of three books and numerous articles, and as a longtime faculty member at the University of Kansas, he established the European Studies Program, a minor in conflict and peace studies, as well as a program on uh, ind indigenous nation studies. Um, he speaks to us tonight about the history of globalization, and as you've seen probably in the blurb on the talk, um, one of the things he's going to alert us to is that oftentimes we find that what many of us think is so very new, if you're a good historian, as President Strickwater is, there's usually some, some trace of that in the past that we can learn from. I think we will hear tonight, though, that the argument is not that history repeats itself, but that we can learn much more about the present by knowing more about the past. And so uh, Carl and I often don't have much time to talk about history and our work together, um, but it's a great pleasure to here as a member of the faculty and a scholar of field. Thank you. Well, thank you, and I appreciate your interest in what may seem a bit of an arcane topic of history, but I hope uh, I can enlighten you to give you some sense of the relevance of the past as uh, the provost has said, for the present and for the future. There are times in history when one has an uncanny sense that we have been here before. We may be in one of those times. The last two and a half centuries have been remarkable for how much the world has changed. The Industrial Revolution, democracy, electronic communications, the separation between religion and politics, all of these are things that did not exist only a few generations ago. Consequ consequently, we usually focus on how new everything is. It's sobering then to realize that only a hundred years ago, in 1912, the world looked in some profound ways like 2012. The world experienced an era of unparalleled economic globalization, ever closer communication across con continents, growing international cooperation, while at the same time there was anxiety about economic crises and terrorism. In many ways then, the world of a century ago was quite like our own. And yet, in a few short years, everything that the people of 1912 had known was swept away. The Great War, as it was known already within months of its outbreak, destroyed the globalization of the 19th century, divided nations and social movements, and left a bitter legacy for decades to come. The war was a conflict that virtually no, had no justifiable purpose except the fear of a few powerful leaders that they could not back down in the midst of a diplomatic confrontation that began in reaction to an act of terrorism. 
The war took nine million lives, cost at least a trillion dollars in today's terms, and set back the world economy for almost 50 years. The war's wake swept away centuries-old empires, created new countries, and profoundly changed customs, lifestyles, habits, and even art and literature. Are there lessons here for us? Could we in 2012 be living close to a cataclysm, much like the Great War, that would sweep all our assumptions away? The First World War ended the long, longest period of peace in modern history. For a hundred years, the world had not known a major war among more than two of the great powers. The 19th century had seen the greatest explosion of wealth and innovation in history. International trade in 1914 was 30 times larger than it had been in 1815. By 1914, a world wide web of telegraph cables circled the globe so that news and prices went within minutes from New York to London to Calcutta. In some ways, the world was even more globalized then than it is now. Migration was far easier than it was ever to be again. Millions migrated without passports. My grandfather left his hometown in Europe at age 17 because there was no work, got as far as Seattle, ran out of money, worked all winter as a carpenter building a school, and then went all the way back to Europe, only to find there was still no work in his village. He made that transatlantic journey at least twice before meeting a young woman in Michigan, born of immigrant parents, and deciding that America was the place to stay. For all the talk of illegal immigrants and refugees today, the proportion of migrants in the world's population before the Great War was twice as high as it is today. At the same time, the world before the war faced huge social problems. There was virtually no social welfare, almost no health insurance, higher education was reserved for a tiny elite, and the gap between rich and poor was enormous. The trend in health, education, and the standard of living was clearly upward, but often painfully slow and uneven and contested. More complex still was the debate over the future. Some saw continued progress in economic growth. Others saw progress, but only through a social revolution, peaceful or violent, which would dramatically redistribute the fruits of economic growth. Others saw economic growth as frightening because it threatened old hierarchies. All recognized that globalization, although they didn't call it that, had meant huge gains in wealth and innovation, but had raised new questions about the gains and losses that economic growth entails. Farmers and lower middle class artisans and shopkeepers suffered the most. But many workers whose numbers grew in conservative military and diplomatic establishments, which still saw war as a tool of statecraft, and prejudices about the peoples of the world outside of Europe, Mitigating the negative effects of globalization, in retrospect, too often went unaddressed. The Great War left long, long shadows. None of the major political movements or turning points in the 20th century could have happened without the First World War. Communism, Nazism, the Great Depression, the Second World War, the Holocaust, the Cold War. Without the slaughter at Verdun, where armies suffered 700,000 casualties in 10 months, and neither side gained any ground, neither Auschwitz nor Hiroshima could have happened. As philosopher William Barrett wrote in his classic study, Irrational Man, August 1914 is the axial date in modern Western history. And once past it, we are confronted with the present day world. The fear of invasion and the police state methods that fueled the communist side of the Cold War grew directly out of the Bolsheviks' experience of World War I and the Civil War that followed. Through the Cold War, the legacy of the Great War lasted very long indeed. 
I vividly remember the morning of November 10, 1989, when news of the fall of the Berlin Wall the night before reached us. A wise old professor at my university, steeped in European culture, stopped me in the hall and asked, did the 20th century just end? I replied that perhaps after 75 years it had, and the 21st century, whose future is still unclear even now, had begun. So one could say that the world in 1912 was at a crossroads. It took a tragic turn that shaped the history of the next 75 years. We may be at a crossroads ourselves in 2012. It is crucial then, I believe, to ask fundamental questions about the Great War and about globalization and to ask ourselves what the history lessons are that we can take from this story. Well, first, where did the globalization from the, that, that the Great War ended, where did that come from? Globalization originated in trade between distant regions, followed by people and capital moving between those regions. But for thousands of years, this trade had amounted to only a small portion of economic activity. What held trade back was, first of all, a lack of technology, and second, poor organization or more specifically, underdeveloped markets. While the discovery of the new world and of direct trade routes between Europe and Asia allowed trade to grow substantially, it was the Industrial Revolution that fueled globalization. Steam, coal, electricity, gas, oil, plastics, trains, automobiles, the telephone, scientific agriculture, all of these represent breakthroughs in technology that fueled the economic growth of the last two centuries and propelled globalization forward. Political revolutions usually happen and are over. The Industrial Revolution is still going on. Whereas for centuries economic growth was incremental or didn't happen at all, today we live with the assumption that annual growth is the norm. And for most of the last 200 years, it has been. Technology provided only one part of the impetus towards globalization. It was, if you will, a necessary but not sufficient cause. Equally important was the expansion of markets and new forms of organization. Before the 19th century, there was little sense that the economy was a complex system with its own rules, which had to be supported to grow on its own. The revolution in economic ideas and organization of the 19th century was to see that the best way to have a strong government was to have a strong economy, first of all. Supported by government action like railroads and education, but not controlled by the government. One part of this revolution was the reduction in tariffs, so-called free trade. But governments also <coughs> liberated migration, dismantled barriers to professions. And at the same time, there was a huge increase in government work in areas such as creating corporations, allowing for stock exchanges, and creating the whole body of patent law, rights of way, and currency controls. Capping off this growth of economic government regulation inside economies were intergovernmental agreements which made the world economy possible. Between 1840 and 1914, European countries created over 30 international organizations to regulate the post office, ocean travel, telegraph lines, migration, family reunification. Winston Churchill, not famous in his later career for starry-eyed idealism, in 1908 declared, with every year that passes over the globe, with every improvement in communication, the unity of the civilized world and the interrelation and interdependence of all civilized communities is being steadily and irresistibly advanced. The European arrangement, which the free trader looks forward to, is a cooperative commonwealth, a great banding together of all the peoples of the empire, of Europe, of Christendom, and ultimately the world. International finance was a third key to the international economy of the 19th century. The stability of the British pound and agreements between banks created a high degree of security, 
for international lenders and investors. Ron Paul notwithstanding, the gold standard by itself did not provide international financial stability. The gold standard existed because there was international financial stability made possible by a very restricted international monetary regime which functioned only within a narrow band and depended on interbank bank cooperation. Well, second, what effects did this first era of globalization have on the world? The profits from industrialization and international monetary stability led to a veritable explosion of foreign investment. British foreign in investment quadrupled between 1854 and 1874 and then quadrupled again by 1913. The late 19th century was remarkable in that European investors could choose between virtually all the countries of the world as a, where, as a place to put their savings. Do you remember that scene in Mary Poppins where the little boy is coaxed to invest his pence? That was based on something. Railroads in China competed with streetcar companies in Uruguay that competed with grain elevators in Russia. Combined with migration, the effect of investment was to begin to even out the great gaps between the most industrialized countries and the less industrialized countries. The years before 1914 also saw the first surge of growth in Latin America, Asia, and Africa that moved them closer to Europe and North America rather than farther away. By 1903, the British jurist, British jurist Lord Bryce could write, it's hardly too much to say that for economic purposes, all mankind is fast becoming one people. J.G. Bartholomew, Bartholomew, editor of the Atlas of the World's Commerce, could write, at no period in the world's history has there been commercial expansion of such stupendous growth as at the beginning of this 20th century. Every year new lands are being exploited and new regions open to commerce. Everywhere the old is giving way to the new, the barriers of ancient civilizations are breaking down. The centers of trade are changing and will continue to change as long as this great development advances. Such an expansion means not only penetration into new lands, but the growth of an intellectual conception of the world as a whole, involving the expansion of our economic, political, and social horizon. That was written in 1907. Sounds a little like Thomas Friedman, right? The cultural impact of the new world economy was even more profound. The tragedy of the 19th century was that so much of the transfer of ideas, technology, and economic innovation outside of Europe came through imperialism. Even in the lands which Europeans didn't conquer, Ottoman Turkey, Iran, Thailand, Japan, China, Europeans, and sometimes Americans, acted unilaterally and aggressively. Ironically, while European nations came to compete with each other in great power politics on a worldwide scale, they also came increasingly to try to define themselves as one white race in opposition to a yellow or oriental or a black African race. The British biologist Carl Pearson in 1900 proclaimed that there is a struggle of race against race and of nation against nation. In the early days of that struggle, it was a bland, unconscious struggle of barbaric tribes. At the present day, in the case of the civilized white man, it has become more and more the conscious, carefully directed attempt of a nation to fit itself into a constantly changing environment. Those opposed to Western dominance in Asia and Africa saw things differently. They denounced imperialism, but sought to use Western techniques to prevent being conquered or controlled. The Islamic reformer Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, active in Afghanistan, Egypt, India, and Turkey, argued that European dominance was due to science, which other societies could adapt. If someone looks deeply into the question, wrote Afghani, he will see that science rules the world. The Europeans have now put their hands on every part of the world. The English have grabbed Afghanistan. The French have grabbed Tunisia. In reality, this usurpation, aggression, and conquest has not come from the French or the English. Rather, it is science that everywhere manifests its greatness 
and power. One of the leading modernizers of the Maiji era in Japan, Fukuzawa Yukichi, in 1874 justified adopting the West's commitment to progress in order to save his country from losing its independence and identity. This is Fukuzawa. Men's sights are now being reset on the goal of elevating Japanese civilization to parity with the West, or even surpassing it. Since Western civilization is even now in a process of transition and progress day by day, month by month, we Japanese must keep pace with it without abating our efforts. The arrival of the Americans in 1850s, Commodore Perry coming into Tokyo Harbor, the arrival of the Americans in the 1850s has, as it were, kindled a fire in our people's hearts. Now that it is ablaze, it can never be extinguished. The tragic lesson of Western imperialism was that the West had to be resisted through militarism. Modernization was not only essential to resist the West. One could only be independent, modern, if you will, if one conquered others. In the most influential popular essay on politics of the Maiji era, Nikai Choman's wonderfully titled, listen, A Discourse by Three Drunkards on Government. <laughs> Whoever said the Japanese don't have a sense of humor? A Discourse by Three Drunkards on Government. In this essay, Choman's fictional Mr. Champion, who represents what Japan must do, tells his more liberal opponent, the gentleman of Western learning, that Japan had to imitate the military strength of the West. Unless we build up the number of soldiers and battleships and increase our nation's wealth and enlarge our land, we may perish. This is the simple logic of arithmetic. Haven't you learned from the examples of Burma and Poland? In other words, Japan had to avoid the fate of lands conquered by the British and the Russians. So though, to those outside of Europe, European militarism was clear. The question emerges why the many within Europe who saw the militarism leading to war did not do more to stop it. Why then did the war, Great War break out? And why didn't people try to prevent war? The outbreak of the First World War has often been blamed on nationalism. The enthusiastic, flag-waving crowds marching through the streets of Berlin and Paris in August 1914 would seem to indicate that national feeling played a major role. Nationalism indeed grew over the 19th century. The age when national anthems, flags, patriotic textbooks, and national histories all appeared for the first time. But few Frenchmen were willing to risk war to take back Alsace-Lorraine which had been lost to Germany in 1871. Even in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, riven by rival ethnic groups, almost no national minority leaders expected the empire's demise. More autonomy was their typical demand. Nor did imperialism lead directly to the First World War. For most of the 19th century, Britain dominated imperial expansion. France was its chief rival in Africa and Southeast Asia, Russia its rival in the Mideast and in Central and Northeast Asia. Yet these three imperial rivals ended up as allies in the First World War. The First World War, I would argue, is better understood as a huge backlash against the forces unleashed by globalization. The social sectors hurt by rapid economic growth the lower middle class, farmers, conservative economic elites, especially in Germany, turned against international economic ties and supported militaristic solutions to ensure their security and prosperity. As the German general Felix Bernardi claimed in 1912 in a famous book translated into English as Germany and the Next War, Germany needed to prepare for a war because the livelihood of our working class directly depends on the maintenance and expansion of our export trade. It's a question of life and death for us to keep open our overseas commerce. We cannot reject the possibility that a state 
under the necessity of providing remunerative work for its population may be driven to war. Tragically backed even by brilliant intellectuals such as the sociologist Max Weber, Germany's leaders built up a battle fleet whose only use could be for a war with Britain, picked quarrels with France and Russia, and encouraged their allies in Austria-Hungary to opt for military means to escape dealing with their empire's domestic problems. Germany's leaders hoped that they would emerge from a quick, decisive war with an impregnable position in Europe, able to gain more colonies and spheres of influence around the world. In fact, rather than improving their position in the world economy, they destroyed the world economy. Or rather, both sides did in the course of an all-out war. Both sides expropriated each other's property, cut off trade and finance, arrested each other's citizens, and banned each other's goods. What about those who desperately wanted peace? The peace activists before the war to whom we owe today's Nobel Peace Prize, have often been portrayed as hopeless idealists out of touch with reality. In fact, since then, many of their ideas have been put successfully into practice in the United Nations, International Peacekeeping and Mediation, and the International Court of Justice. It's odd to indict the peace activists for a lack of realism when the military and diplomatic leaders of Europe were almost to a man and they were all men, were completely naive about the impact of the new weapons, the advantage of the defensive over the offensive in combat, and the effects of industrialized warfare. The real weakness of the peace movement was that they saw war as something that arose out of disputes, that one or more of the great powers would deliberately attack another in order to pro improve their economic, military, or diplomatic position was something that they did not comp comprehend. The peace movement, too, wanted to transcend diplomacy, not work with it, with the result that peace activists had often few practical policies to urge on statesmen in specific crises. The peace movement has learned volumes since the debacle of the Great War. What is more striking is that, as we know from the case of the Iraq War, the lack of press and legislative oversight on matters of peace and war is still only barely better than was the case in 1914. Why, after the war, did globalization get started again for almost 75 years? The Great War undid almost all the foundation on which 19th century globalization had depended. In place of relatively free trade, tariffs increased dramatically. Between 1913 and 1931 in Europe, for example, they went from 14 to 25 percent. Huge reparations owed by Germany to the Allies and nearly equally huge debts owed by the Allies to the United States made it difficult for countries to practice the kind of interbank cooperation which had been essential before the war. Governments never allowed migration to flow, flow as freely as before. The United States, for example, imposed the Quotas Act of 1924, an agreement hailed by the Los Angeles Times as, quote, a Nordic victory. The Quotas Act cut migration from Eastern and Southern Europe to a trickle even though there were millions of underemployed peasants and workers there who wanted to migrate. After the war, too, the, allies, the allied countries focused more narrowly on trade and investments in their own colonies. It was actually the post-World War I era, post-war, that was the real era of imperialism, at least in an economic sense. France, Britain, Belgium, and the Netherlands turned more to bilateral trade with their own colonies away from multilateral trade. The effects of this were long-lasting. As late as 1992, 95% of the exports from Africa and South Asia went to countries outside of their own regions, overwhelmingly 
to Europe. More importantly, there was a failure of international leadership. Before 1914, Great Britain, supported by France, had helped keep the international financial system afloat by maintaining the pound sterling at a stable rate of exchange, the so-called gold standard, leading loan efforts between the major banks and serving always as an open market for goods. Now, Great Britain, having lost three quarters of a million men and nearly bankrupted itself in World War I, was too weakened economically to do this. The United States had the economic strength, but we refused to play the role. The United States refused to negotiate inter-allied war debts until it was too late to make a difference. The result was that private bankers only partially filled a role that needed political leadership. And the world economy never fully recovered from the Great War before falling into the worst depression of modern history. Well, why has globalization taken off in the last 30 years? After the slow rebuilding of international trade and investment between 1945 and the 1960s, several crucial events propelled globalization forward. The European Economic Community, the so-called common market, encouraged United States firms to expand into Europe, which in turn helped fuel the growth of multinational corporations everywhere. Then the oil shocks of the 1970s triggered a huge upsurge in international finance as so-called petrodollars, huge profits in the coffers of the oil producers had to be recycled. Then the fall of Berlin Wall in 1989, the dismantling of the Soviet Union in 1991 meant that 400 million people were once again members of the world economy as their countries had been before the Great War. The next major change in the communist world was Deng Xiaoping's reforms beginning in 1979, but which by 2010 led China to become the world's largest economy after the United States. And finally, how does our current era of globalization in 2012 look similar or different to that of 1912? Globalization today builds on the foundations set in the 19th century, but is it equally important to see that there are radically new things about globalization today. The spread of international acti economic activity means there are several centers, not just one center of trade and investment as before 1914. Before 1914, North American and Western European firms traded and invested in Asia, Latin America, and Africa. Countries in those regions with the exception of Japan, didn't generate much international activity on their own. The wave of globalization in the last 20 years has made not just East Asia, but Brazil, India, South Korea, Turkey, the home of multinational corporations. This is a real break from the past. There's also a much higher level of formal organization in international affairs. All those international agreements of the pre-1914 world performed an amazingly diverse set of activities, but they had almost no connection with each other, little connection to nation states, and were not connected to any larger organization, as we do today under the United Nations. This higher level of formal organization is also true in terms of the great powers. The so-called Concert of Europe before 1914 was always informal, rested on custom, and depended on the goodwill of a few states. Nothing compelled the great powers to come together to settle the Balkan Wars of 1912-13, for example, except for a tradition of consultation, a very weak national public opinion in a few countries, and self-interest. Russia and Austria-Hungary thought that the Balkan autonomy had gone far enough, and Germany decided it wanted to support its ally, Austria-Hungary. A few years later, in the fateful summer of 1914, Germany and Austria-Hungary decided differently and were free to do so with tragic consequences. Today, NATO, the US-Japanese alliance, the Security Council of the UN, and other organizations are much able, more able to mediate between other countries to negotiate and settle conflicts. 
for all the, their failures, these alliances and security arrangements still make for a more stable world than what existed before 1914. What is more, the major industrial powers recognize at least a bit that international political cooperation is a requisite for international economic stability. The G7, now become the G20, represents a recognition between political and economic realms that simply had never existed until recently. <clears throat> Similarly, the sheer scale of non-governmental organizations is a major breakthrough by comparison with earlier eras. International social movements were a novelty in the late 19th century. Today, NGOs are one of the major ways governments and the UN actually carry out their work in countries such as Bosnia, Afghanistan, Sudan, and Cambodia. If the total budgets of all non-governmental organizations in the world were considered as one, and compared to the gross national product of the various countries of the world, the, the NGO sector would rank as the sixth largest economy in the world with an estimated budget of one and a half trillion. What lessons can we take from the past for our present and the future? First, globalization is not inevitable, no, how, no matter how powerful a force it may be. It depends on peace, international cooperation, and financial stability. If these were to weaken, globalization could end. If our current economic crisis were to be combined with a major international conflict, 2033 might look like 1933. Second, a veneer of peace and prosperity can easily blind a generation to the latent power held by governments in their midst and the lurking problems within society that defy easy solutions. Governments still hold tremendous power over their populations despite globalization power that is usually unquestioned and which they can use for enormous good or ill. Like the generation before 1914, we who live before 2014 can easily miss the underlying conflicts and profound fears in the world around us. The desperation driving migrants and refugees, the environmental crises and disease in developing countries, and the failures of democracy to replace dictatorship. Allowing these conflicts to fester encourages recourse to military means to suppress or escape these concerns. War is always a danger and never a solution. Third and finally, one can learn that we can learn from history. <clears throat> Remembering World War I can also give us hope for some of our seemingly intractable global problems. The wounds of the war were extremely deep, but they have healed. There is no conflict in the world today, not between Israelis and Palestinians, Indians and Pakistanis, or even North Korea and its neighbors, that is as deep or as long-lasting or as fatal as those which fueled World War I. Over a 75-year period, five million French and Germans died in the wars between those two countries. It's moving now, if one goes to Verdun, to see those two countries as the staunchest of allies, and to see the grandchildren of those who fought and died on that battlefield walk side by side in silent meditation on conflicts which have long since faded away. The war began the long debate in which we are still engaged about America's place in the world. The debate over whether the United States should enter the Great War nearly tore parts of the country apart. Tragically, the enthusiasm which followed our entry was matched by the disillusion after the war when Americans realized that this war, like all others, cannot bring easy solutions without decades of sustained effort and wise leadership. The United States rejected the Treaty of Versailles that was to have ended the war. It rejected the League of Nations that President Wilson hoped would ensure peace in Europe. It turned its back on the problems of the world beyond our own shores. America and the world paid a terrible price 
for our, our isolationism. Nothing demonstrates so clearly that one can learn from history as the difference between the actions of the United States in 1919 and our actions in 1945. After 1945, the so-called greatest generation created the international institutions that still define our world and provide the bedrock for globalization and international cooperation. The United Nations, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, NATO, GATT, now turned into the World Trade Organization. For all their faults, and they have great faults, these organizations provide a framework potentially for peace and cooperation, which the pre-1914 world lacked. They need improvement, but a framework is vastly preferable to the anarchy before 1914. Ultimately then, America learned from the Great War that it cannot avoid responsibility for the world and that we must learn from history, sometimes, time and time again, the same lessons. The changes of our own era may seem breathtaking. The human choices, however, about war and peace, conflict and cooperation, isolation and responsibility are much the same as those of generations before us. Victor Hugo said that revolution changes everything except the human heart. The same could be said of war and the apparent novelty of our own day. But because we are fundamentally the same as the men and women of an earlier era, they have much to teach us. As long as we can look back with introspection upon history, we will be better able to meet the challenges of the future. We should listen as those of 1912 failed to do to the words of prophets who sometimes see more clearly into the future than historians. Here is Bengali poet Rambanadrath Tagore, the first writer outside Europe to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. Writing in 1912, who, who perhaps captured better than any political analyst, The Rising Danger. This is the last stanza of his poem 100 in his Song Offerings, a poem often called Monsoon Weather. In that rumbling over there, in the havoc of the Northeast, where a storm takes on its nature what is whispered on the air. What irrevocable future in the deepening shadows pieced on the horizon in night stillness carries its own speechless pain as it reaches to its fullness in the dark side of the brain. Black imagination leads into what forthcoming deeds? Monsoon weather now I see all around humanity. Thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? Oh, yeah. That's a very good question. I think if you look back at what happened as a result of the First World War, you can see that, yes, certain things do not go away. I mean, unless you know, we have a nuclear holocaust or a comet hits us or something. But you know, certainly the infrastructure of steamship lines and telegraph lines, railroad lines, um, you know, those things stayed. So there was you know, some degree of international economic activity that still stayed between countries. And it even restarted for a while in the 1920s, only to come crashing down again. But, and, and there were, of course, even areas where things grew. I mean, it's, it's the interwar period that uh, automobiles really made their breakthrough. 
all right, and, and other things that later are going to be really important later. But what's interesting is how much contraction there was. So it's interesting in the 1920s and 30s and even to the early 40s, you get a whole range of countries that practice what economists call import substitution. They don't want to import things from other countries. They want to produce it themselves. They have big tariffs, Latin America, India, Turkey did this a lot, Iran. I mean, it's a very common, and in many ways, the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, and, and warlord Japan are all examples of that too. So given a rising, po still rising population, what's interesting is how much of the international activity didn't flow into the global economy. So I think that's, you know, looking into the future, we could, we would, I mean, we certainly would not lose the internet and, and lots of what connects the countries. But if, if for example, we had not uh, s um, stabilized the world financial system when Lehman Brothers went down in 2008-9, and, and you can see how dangerous this is right now with the European sovereign debt and the, and the dangers of the euro. I mean, you could have really drastically uh, cut back so that you'd have all kinds of multinational corporations and countries that pull back on their investments and they, and they lower the amount of trade and they start raising tariffs and so on. So certainly a contraction and maybe you know, a plateau for a long, long period. In that sense, in that sense, globalization being an upward process, I would say could be stopped. Okay, I don't think we would fall back, but we'd certainly not advance any further. Yes, David. Hi, Carl. Um, thanks. This was this is great. I have, I have a comment, and um, I'd be interested in my comment on my comments. You talked about the IMF um, and the World Trade of Bretton Woods, right. um, the, the United Nations. But I was always sort of taught that that, that was a Whiggish history <laughs> to approach it that way. And, and what about this notion? That was the, the sort of Anglo-American approach mm -hmm. coming after the Second World War. Yep. And so you, you create these international bodies, organizations, and whatnot, mm -hmm. to essentially ratify and justify your perspective, your way of life. And then you've got this tremendous military that's going to help to police that. Mm -hmm. And what you know is, is that any better than what it replaced? I think it's a great deal better than what it replaced. It had its problems, yes. I mean, let me just go back to what you're saying. Oh, it's very true. I mean, you can look at um, Keynes and the people that he worked with uh, on the United States side. Uh, there is very much trying to recapture the best aspects of what they saw as the pre-1914 world, which was a, a free-flowing uh, world trade and, and financial system and so on, uh, and one they hoped it would also be much more peaceful. And it is certainly true, the United States gained enormously from that system for, uh, you know, for decades. In a way, though, uh, I mean, you could also argue the United States, um, you know, we didn't use it to control other countries nearly as dramatically as we could have. Uh, we opened our, our borders to trade, which, you know, we were, we were stronger then in terms of our exports and so on. But the United States, in some ways, did support a lot of the world to get back on its feet. Um, a lot of faults, I understand, and so forth. But... Uh, I think the remarkable thing is how much we've adjusted as we have. If you look at the World Trade Organization, it is a much more of an, um, an equal voiced system than one of would have predicted, say, certainly 50 years ago. So there's a, there's a lot of good aspects, I think, to that system. Faults, yes. Uh, I mean, it did run very much more for uh, countries like the United States than it did for others, much for quite a while. Uh, and the United States, uh, made, um, you know, really huge errors in the, some ways that we intervened in other countries, which I think was totally unnecessary in terms of defending that international economic system. But I wouldn't say it's all a, a Whiggish history. I mean, I think there are, there are ways in which, um, as opposed to the alternatives, which were, uh, you know, again, a sort of set of blocks in the world, which is what the best you could have seen in the 1920s or 30s, it was a huge advance. I don't think it adapted nearly as well as it could have. Uh, we, you know, we, we still have the issue of bringing other countries into that system better. Best example is the Security Council of the United States, I mean, of the United Nations. I mean, it's totally anachronistic um, that, you know, that it, it doesn't have, doesn't represent, it represents 1945. It doesn't represent the, um, the world of today. So that should be changed. And there's other huge issues with the IMF and so on, certainly. But, it's, it's a vast improvement Well, what could have happened. It's a vast improvement, I think, of both before 1914 and certainly the 20s and 30s. Yes? Well, thank you for your very stimulating presentation. I, I like the way you were drawing parallels 
hear you. Um, one of the things that occurred to me, and you mentioned it just in, in the comments just after your talk in response to a question, you mentioned the EU's sovereign crisis, yeah. uh, debt crisis. Um, and when you were talking about uh, politicians and statesmen, uh, just before the outbreak of the First World War, realizing that you know, there was incredible militarization and yet not doing it, uh, yeah. fiddling while the bomb was burning, um, do, you, do you see any kind of analogy with what is happening in Europe right now, where it seems quite obvious what should be done, and yet politicians are finding reasons to do nothing? Um. Well, I wouldn't quite say they're doing nothing, but they're having a very difficult time with it. But of course, remember, the populations that they're representing in many cases are, you know, are difficult to deal with too. Germans and Northern Europeans in general, uh, who have much stronger uh, you know, fi financial situations, you have to convince them it's in their interest to help bail out those countries like uh, particularly Greece and, and others that, that uh, are under a lot of pressure. Um, I mean, again, you can always look at the glass half full or half empty. What is remarkable is that French and German collaboration, which is at the core of the common market the EU for 50 years, has survived as far as it has. And you know, it, we, you're right, the jury is still out. But if they could, if they could reach a solution, um, it would make a huge difference for the whole global economy. I mean, in a way, what's frustrating about this whole situation is that when they invented the euro, they actually knew what they were supposed to do. Economists told them, here's the band within which you can allow a budget deficit. Okay? Here's you know, uh, the, the portion of national debt versus your GDP. You know, I mean, they had all these targets and they didn't obey them. So I mean, in a sense, the whole European Union got itself into this struggle. And that's, that's one of the frustrating things about it is it's, it's in a way they, they, they set it up right, didn't follow it, and now they're paying the price. Other questions? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you said in the last wave of globalization since 1945, we have these uh, organizations like UN and IMF mm -hmm. and so uh, But it also occurred to me we have things like uh, enormously grown uh, military industrial complex in Eisenhower War mm -hmm. against that. And that entity now has its own interest, yeah. and, and they're interested in growing. And, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if they're interested in propagating more, but it's justifying. Yeah. Uh, severe spend. Do you think that helps us to? No. To I mean, one of the, the what, what, one of the tragedies of military establishments if you, is that if you have the arms, the temptation eventually to use them is very hard to resist. And the United States does not have a great record here. I mean, as we know, uh, over 45 percent of all the arms in the world are the United States. Uh, we are the biggest arms exporter in the world. There's a lot of wars in the world where both sides are using American-made weapons, all right? Uh, now, we, in terms of what that power could, could produce, you, you know, you can might say that we've limited ourselves in some ways. Iraq is a horrible exception. But um, it's still, you know, we should take more of the lead working with other countries, I think, to, to you know, lower armaments around the world, uh, to lessen the propagation of the arms trade, um, in, in many ways. I mean, we could be much better leader than we are. And you're absolutely right. The, uh, when I teach global history, I always have a lecture on um, uh, America and the world. And I love to ask questions in class. It's sort of like quiz show, right? So the quiz show is, uh, example is, how many bases does the Pentagon control around the world? Anyone guess? I mean, th there's two answers to it. One answer is, it's a thousand. Another answer is, Nobody knows, including the Pentagon, because there's so many sub-bases to major bases that they're uh, buying and selling and leasing land all the time. It's almost like a constant ticker. There's actually, they don't even know how many bases they have at one time. There's so many. It's that big. This is another question. How many golf courses do the American Armed Forces own around the world? 200. Okay. So, I mean, that, so it's a kind of American military empire in a way. And it, it's not to our credit, and it's, it's not been a good thing for the world in a lot of ways. Yes. Carl, you uh, talked about the first globalization being driven by race theory. Mm -hmm. um, well, I wouldn't say driven, but it's hugely infusing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, what is your reflection on um, the next wave? I mean, you could think about one of the great differences coming out of 45 is things like the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Right. But what are your general thoughts about 
drawing parallels there with her departures? Well, I do think that things like the human rights movement and other initiatives that encourage understanding between peoples, particularly in the most recent era, between religions, interfaith cooperation and understanding is hugely important. Uh, and I think you know, that those kinds of divisions are going to take different forms in different eras. Because the other thing we don't realize often is race is a fairly invented thing. You can go back a couple, maybe in 150, 200 years in European history, and race was not that big an issue. It was created. In fact, it was the science of its day. Sort of scary. It was the, it was the new thing. Um, so I think you, know, you have to always be aware of what could be the next conflict. And I think right now, religion, particularly because of Islam, is such a huge issue that we have to bridge those differences as much as possible. Looking forward in the future, it could be political ideology again, as it was in the Cold War. Uh, I think that that is a possibility. Other questions? Yes. I'm not certain whether this is a question or an observation, but I'll see if one doesn't come out of the other. If I understand correctly, the dynamic of these moments of uh, intensity, turning points in history, you might call them, in this case was created by a disparity between the quickness of globalization and the lag in accommodation. Maybe the question is, uh, should globalization be handled with not only care, but uh, implemented gradually? Yeah. yeah. I, th I think in a nutshell, you could argue that, that yes, the economic change vastly outran the institutional mechanisms to handle it, and particularly to preserve the, the peace that would, that would sort of continue to make the good aspects of economic growth happen. And that is, I think, the challenge for our own day. I mean, the G20 is a huge advance that we don't have as much of a restricted club of basically Canada, the United States, and Western Europe, and Japan. We have admitted China, we've been sort of half to admit China, but we have brought in other countries into that club to make some decisions about international financial stability. But we, and the World Trade Organization is a, is a kind of remarkable organization how much we have allowed ourselves to pay penalties. I mean, we've actually listened to them and we've used it. Other countries have, we've gone to the WTA, uh, WTO and other countries have listened to it and they've been, you know, had to accept its discipline. So we have some mechanisms there, but we have a lot more to do. As I say, the UN, I mean, has huge problems that it doesn't represent the, the logic of world economic or political power. Um, you know, other, other issues where, I mean, migration is something that it's very difficult to deal with on an international level, but it's hugely critical. So, I mean, there, there are uh, environmental issues that are another one, but, you know, we, we, we have to create the mechanisms to deal with this much more globalized world because I think if we don't, uh, yes, the economic change could actually outrun our ability to, to handle the problems. very much. We have a reception outside. Please stay and ask more questions. Uh, please join me now and thank you, President Shukor.